are so pleased and so honored this year at the Myrtle Beach International Film Festival to be visited by two really dedicated veterans of the film industry and our honorees for lifetime achievement at this year's film festival. We are talking about Melissa Gilbert and Timothy Busfield. Thank you so much for being here. What an honor and what a pleasure. Thank you, Joel. The Thanks. film is called Guest Artist. Yes. Tell us about Guest Artist. <laughs> uh, guest Artist uh, <laughs> originally uh, was a play okay. written by Jeff Daniels. Jeff has a theater in Michigan called the Purple Rose Theater Company. And he's written about 20 plays, and maybe not that many, 19, 18 plays, but I've produced a lot of the plays uh, in Sacramento, and Jeff and I became really good friends back in the early 80s, mm -hmm. when we were members of the Circle Repertory Company in New York. And we both created roles for the Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Lanford Wilson. Wow. And Jeff had commissioned Lance to come to Michigan, and what you see in the movie is kind of how Lance showed up. And uh, Jeff, after he passed, Jeff wrote it into a play. Not in a negative way about him, but really tried to bring up the truth about kind of what Lamford was like. And then also really kind of make a statement about the death of art, you know, and how we're struggling to maintain the American theater and where do you turn and how do you, you know, where have we gotten to that um, the only plays that seem to come to New York that are new are from movies like yeah. Groundhog Day and things yeah. like that, which was produced by one of our producers. So that was the genesis. He came to, we started a company, uh, Melissa, Jeff and I, he came over to our house one morning. Uh, I don't even think we were out of our pajamas. I think we were just <laughs> sitting there and we would hang out. We lived maybe a half hour from each other. And Jeff said, I'd like to make guest artists into a movie. Do you think we can do that? And we looked at each other and said, why yeah, not? effortless, why not? Let's yeah. do it. Uh, Melissa found uh, the money through Michael Alden, uh, a Tony award-winning, Emmy award-winning producer who grew up in her house. Wow. Uh, we have best friends with one of her sons. And uh, the rest is uh, just basic filmmaking. Write it, budget it, shoot it, edit it, put it, get it into Myrtle Beach. And you are you are the producer for this, correct? I am. I'm one of the I'm one of the producers, and I'm a representative of Grand River, which is a company that Jeff and Tim and I own together, the three of us. Okay, and not only producer, but it sounds like you were involved in set design, and the both of you you were cinematographer, you were editor, you were producer, you were well, director, Willie, everything. Our, our cinematographer our was our son Willie, okay, um, uh, who's a. Is, does Chanel stuff, so he works, he's a professional. A very, 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 yeah. uh, very um, prolific high-end fashion director of photography. And so this is his first feature film. But we all did a bunch of different jobs. I found the locations, Tim did costumes. It was very much sort of a mom and pop operation and, and the way we wanted to do it. And you know, the whole mission, one of the part of the mission statement of Grand River is for us to be able to make quality entertainment and a reasonable budget in um, as close to our homes as possible mm -hmm. and employ people that we um, admire and whose work we respect and enable them to move up in their professions into the next tier in that whatever that discipline is so that they have an opportunity to do work they wouldn't have otherwise. So. Willie got to be a director of photography on his first feature film. Jeff's son, um, Ben, composed the music for the score. Um, and our kids and, and our friends, our, our, our first day, our for you, unit production manager had been a, a first AD. So it, it all sort of provides an opportunity for people to work in ways they hadn't and to get a nice credit doing it. I was in Chicago producing a TV show for ABC and I would be out three o'clock in the morning out on the street looking at all the trucks and all the, uh, you know, the flags that we used to, you know, make, uh, you know, block the light and create uh, from and all uh, that we weren't using and all of the actors chairs that weren't even in Illinois anymore. And it was like, why are we going, why are we making this so difficult? And it's to justify a lot of jobs. Yeah. And the truth is in today's world of cinema, the cameras, depending on the story you're telling, uh, we use very high-end Sony F65s, optimal lenses. I mean, we had great equipment uh, that was donated to us, uh, and that person became a producer on the film. But the amount of waste yeah. 
that's going on that's keeping artists from, from completing things. That was frustrating and the pushing a boulder uphill yeah. has been frustrating uh, for us. And Jeff and Melissa and I all said, we can wear a lot of hats, which mm -hmm. is what you'd ask. Why don't, you know, I'll meet the actors at the mall. We'll find your costume. Show me <laughs> pictures of your closet. Pull that out. Uh, Melissa, here's the set. Um, you know, that we found that we could really get small if we didn't say, okay, you need a costume designer, you need a set decorator, you need this and that and that and that and that. It, Not that we don't want to deny anybody work, but we sure. want to enable and, and, and inspire other filmmakers to be able to make their art with having, without having to feel like they have to hire, you know, essentially a circus train of people to come along. And the other thing that is the other part of our mission statement was we wanted to also illustrate to other filmmakers and artists that there's a way to do this without having it all be by committee yeah. with studios and networks and everyone telling us you know what to do or what color the leading lady's shoe should be when there are much more important things to deal with. You made a film a few years ago called One Smart Fellow where you wrote and directed it and I saw where you were talking about that afterwards and you compared the making of that movie to working in a garage band, performing in a garage band. Explain that and, and is that somewhat Guest artist is the same. Yeah, well, it was a, a show I was producing again for ABC. I was in Wilmington, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, again, uh, I was I got a, a conversation with the director of photography and a few other people on a Friday night, and I said, "We can make a movie in a day. It's this is nonsense. We can do it with about six or seven people total, and that's actors, camera, sound. That's all we need." And they laughed, and I said, "I'm serious." <laughs> and we were on the beach in Wilmington. And I said, here's great scope. Here's a story about a guy who wants to leave his wife and convince her it's a good idea. Uh, <laughs> who would want to leave her? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, not one smart fellow, right. that's for sure. So we, I, uh, Melissa was uh, at the Library of Congress where one of her books was being sort of moved into the library or whatever it was, or honored. And she came back and I said, um, Honey, uh, what are we doing next Sunday? And she said, why? <laughs> and I said, we're making a movie. And I, I banged out a story and we worked on it, and improvised, and then we put it up. And I wanted that garage band feel because so many songs, just pulling off the highway, I said to Melissa, songs are endless, it seems, mm -hmm. right? What, the, you got four guys. And not that I would compare us to the Stones or the Beatles or, or Credence or anybody, but those guys went into a space and came out with a gold record. And they didn't need 500 people or 100 people or 40 people. Mm -hmm. uh, they did the work themselves. They wrote it themselves. They played it themselves. They might have added musicians like we would add. But filmmaking has now moved to that level yeah. because the cameras don't need light. Yeah. And now that the cameras don't need extra light, we don't need the trucks, we don't need the equipment. Now you're gonna start to see artists come through Myrtle Beach International Film Festival all around the world. They'll find their way to realize that two cameras, no waiting. Yep. Sound guy, uh, you want good sound. People won't sit through bad sound. They'll sit through out of focus yeah. before they sit through bad sound. But if you get good sound, a couple cameras that can cross shoot, uh, which we used to not be able to do because all everything in this direction was being uh, flooded with light and you couldn't shoot back in this direction. Well now, maybe a couple of lights behind somebody, mm -hmm. give it a little rim, and you're, you have a beautiful image. So I think a garage band, we're still doing it. Guest artist garage band, every job uh, series we're trying to develop and sell, we're trying to figure out how to make it with more control, mm -hmm. less money, mm -hmm. and a higher quality. And there seems to be so many more opportunities to be able to show your work once you're done with it. You mentioned something called Dot Studio Pro, uh, mm -hmm. dot com, if, if I'm correct on that. And, and that's a way for anybody who is an amateur filmmaker, amateur, whatever you want to call it, who still can be able to put a product together at a low budget and be able to have an audience and maybe recoup some of their costs on it? Dot Studio so Pro, yeah. yeah. The, the money it's... will come when the money comes. The biggest mistake in all of art is trying to pay off the work yeah. and then letting other people who gave the money have a say in what you're doing. It'll never happen that way. Yeah. That's the garage band, it has to come. So. 
there are so many different distribution platforms now and, and different ways to do it. And Dot Studio Pro would be uh, like an aggregator who would mm -hmm. then put the film up on iTunes, Netflix, Amazon. Bitmax Bit will also yep. do that. There are a number of companies out there. Or now there's the ability for a filmmaker just to do that themselves and own it and every click goes into their pocket. Yep. Yeah, you know, you can, people, what a lot of filmmakers here should really know is that for about 1500 bucks or $2,000, you can put a movie up on iTunes, Amazon. Uh, you may, you have to deal with their accounting system. Yeah. Uh, but especially, you know, to be able to get your work out there, those platforms are there. Yeah. Uh, and, and you don't have this, so many great uh, uh, artists uh, uh, are intimidated by the idea of how do I get my movie out there. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, that process, which is the last part of the process, blocks the early part of yep. the process. Don't worry about that. Don't plan your Academy Awards speech. <laughs> get together with people you know and trust. The Beatles wrote 100 songs before Please Please Me hit the charts. 100 songs that didn't, get, didn't get made. Yeah. So many young filmmakers, they make that one, they want to put it up there and have it stick against the Hollywood sign like a piece of spaghetti, yeah. and it doesn't happen. Whereas the ones like Field of Dreams we talked about before we started the interview, I didn't think that movie would make money. I knew it was a great script, right. but I didn't think anybody would want to see it. I thought maybe the ladies would want to see it because Kevin was right. so hot right then. I didn't realize that men would respond, and that anticipation of what something will become is such a waste yeah. of energy it stifles everything make it what you, the process that we've repeated thousands of times between jeff and melissa and i is uh, uh write it cast it shoot it edit it move on people know you obviously from field of dreams 30 something Trapper John MD, The West Wing, et cetera. That's all from in front of the camera. Now you're focusing more on directing. Was that a conscious decision on your part to let's move my career behind the camera instead of in front of the camera? How did that evolve? Everything's been conscious okay. in my career. I have very, very planned out and a lot of it planned out starting here in Myrtle Beach uh, with people I met in Myrtle Beach back when I was 20. There's a, there is a path. There's a path from pro sports all the way up to where you can make a living, there's a path in filmmaking. Uh, I had an Emmy Award. It was now time to, when you have a face like mine, to figure out some <laughs> other venue to survive on. I can act a little bit, I can direct a little bit, I can produce a little bit, and when you put those three together, you got kids going through college. Um, it, you know, we're professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, so voiceovers, commercials, directing, producing, what will allow us to have longevity. Sure. Mel Melissa won an Emmy for producing at 14, wow. uh, uh, at, while she was the most recognizable face uh, with Muhammad Ali in the world at the time. <laughs> um, she, her mom, who ran her company, was smart enough, Barbara, to say, let, you know, who, she got the advice, let's, let's go this way, honey, let's go here. What do you wanna do? Well, I love Miracle Worker. Miracle yes. worker, great. Yeah. Let's do this, let's do that. So uh, then running SAG. Um, for us lifers, you know, that are in it for 40 or she's in it 53 years, right? So survival. She started when she was one year old. She, two. Yeah, two. <laughs> survival requires you to learn and grow, yeah. just like in sports. You know, a lot of the players are in the head office or coaching, you know. It definitely behooves us as performers to have hyphenated careers because there are ebbs and flows in every aspect of the industry and so it gives us an opportunity to have something to fall back on as we're transitioning into the next phase whether it's ingenue to mother to school teacher to grandmother to you know grand dame and that's what you i wanted all that in one show <laughs> <laughs> that's what i wanted to ask you about because you got started obviously with little house in the prairie that was many years ago. How do you feel when somebody comes up to you today and says, I loved you on Little House on the Prairie? I feel really grateful that, that the show is so beloved and that I was allowed to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, it means so much to so many people and it is such a blessing to me to have people come up to me and tell me that the show moved them and that you know they they connected to it at whatever phase in life that they did and that they have fond memories of it and people are always smiling when they come up to me so you know I have, I have no complaints about that and Hollywood is historically not very kind and I have to be careful about how I say this to women of a certain age is that changing oh fast enough um, you know however it's changed it is changing I don't know if if there's any really, um, I mean, fast enough for who? It's changing yeah. as fast as it's going to change. It's certainly come quite a long way and there's still a long way to go. But I think also just the performer side of me has diversified so much into doing uh, theater, film, television, voiceover, whatever I can do. And I can tell you that as a woman of a certain age, there is definitely more opportunity right now for me on stage than there is on film. Mm. And, or there has been as I've gone through this, this last transition and this latest transition into um, whatever I am now. So, you know, I, 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 I was doing a lot of theater for a long time and then last year there was one movie and another movie and, you know, things just keep rolling along. There are people, there is some, there is an effort, uh, which might be a good uh, film festival th uh, sidebar is that a lot of people are frustrated as as are we in in our mission statement with the distribution system mm -hmm. the theaters are basically open in the middle of the afternoon I see Teen Spirit Hellboy Captain Marvel Pet Cemetery and the chaperone up behind you mm -hmm. those movies are occupying all the theaters yet those are for younger audiences that are gonna come out tonight yeah. Those theaters could be full right now with films like Guest Artist, yep. where you're gonna have an older audience that it might demographic out to. And we're trying to find ways to not let the exhibitor and the distributor, now the exhibitor wants all movies, mm -hmm. they want butts in the seat, right? That's all the exhibitor wants. The theater is the exhibitor, they want people in the seat. But the distributor, it's, they, they will take a film and if they don't sell it, they'll bury it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the distributor who says, no, I'm going to find show times for you. We're finding that starting to happen. We've had several companies come to us where you can even put up the money for your P&A, uh, the publicity and advertising, and they will do the legwork to make sure you get into the theaters. We've been strangulated by the studio system yeah. uh, from the beginning. And they, even when they control, 20th Century Fox owned the Fox theaters, right? So it, it, now it's down to the multiplex theaters that have a lot of empty seats uh, that are taking a big chunk out of Marvel, but may not, you know, or may not take the big chunk out of Marvel. We'll take 40% at the box office because they know they're still going to sell seats. Whereas they might say, we want 60%, but we'll put guest artists in our theater. That is starting to grow. And when that happens, then the women of an age, mm -hmm. uh, all the uh, ethnicities in the world, all of the art films, I think will find homes in theaters like this. People of our age, we buy movie tickets too. And we want that same level of entertainment along with the 13 and 14 and 15 year old boys. We were, I think, desperate for that kind of entertainment, are we not? And well, that is why all of the streaming services are blowing up the way they are, because yeah. that's where we have to go to get that. Yeah. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about lifetime achievement. Where do you go from here and, and what's, what's your goals? The reason I ask this, next month, Clint Eastwood will be 89 years old and still making movies. Can you two see yourselves when you're 88 years old getting a script in the mail and saying, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's put this movie yes. out. Yes. You know, in our pre profession, we play people. Yeah. And that means in, unless they're not dead, <laughs> yeah. uh, we can play them. Yeah. Uh, and even if they are dead, we can play them. I've yeah. played and, many know, a dead person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I think one of the, I think goals are, again, athletically, uh, I, I don't think you can have goals. I really don't. I'm against that. That, that takes fate and that takes hard work out of play. I don't know. Uh, uh, there might be an end result which is different from what I want, which yeah. was absolutely better than what I wanted. The goal should be, the, and Jack Nicholson uh, uh, 
said this in a Rolling Stone interview, I think in 76. My job is to put in the best 12 hours a day I can, hmm. not look past that. And on a film, you can't look to what it'll do. Everybody wants to talk, God, this could be great. That was an Academy Award performance. On 30-something, we weren't allowed to discuss the Emmys, and yet we won a lot of them. Uh, it, the executive producers, creators, didn't want us to even say Emmy around on the lot. Uh, we turned our eyes away from it. Um, there's fundamentals that miss, get lost in romance. Uh, and romance is, gosh, if I could just if I could just have this, then I could be on a marquee, and then I'll be a big star. Well, that's like going to the plate as a baseball player and say, God, if I hit a home run with bases loaded, then I'll be on the cover of Sporting News. Meanwhile, three pitches come in different directions and yeah. you're on the bench. Yeah. You got to think fundamentals. And, and that, nobody knows them better than this lady right here. Romance doesn't happen to a two-year-old. It doesn't happen to a nine-year-old. What are my lines? What do I, where do I go? What do I say? Uh, how much sleep can I get? When do I learn my lines? When do I shower? When do I make phone calls? Most when do I cook? Most importantly, where's my popsicle? Where's my popsicle? <laughs> <laughs> you know, those are fundamentals. So, sure. you know, right now, uh, uh, our goal is to, uh, you know, find distribution for the film, maybe. Uh, if it happens, if not, maybe we go to Netflix. In the meantime, we're not sitting still. We're developing a series. We have uh, uh, nine episodes of a series that, that we've walked the writers through that we really like. We'll throw that against the wall. Maybe it sticks. Uh, maybe this movie sticks. Uh, but we're going to get up each day and try to improve as professionals. And we've branched out enough we can direct. Melissa's a director as well in the Directors Guild. We'll find some way to survive. I think looking down the road uh, is a negative. Uh, in our in our business, there's Just too keep much going. of that. Keep, keep going. going. The, yeah. Let the agents do all that, and then let it go in one ear and out the other. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you are so you are doing the film festival circuit. What do you think of the Myrtle Beach International Film Festival? You like it? You know what? I, I gained weight, and I wasn't even <laughs> barely off the plane. <laughs> this guy Jerry Dalton gave me food. I need and he did not give me. Had he been a good guy, he would have given me an insulin tab with the food he gave me. So I can't go to the beach. I, I, I added a roll, uh, thanks to Jerry. <laughs> the no, cinnamon roll. The cinnamon roll. I added a complete cinnamon roll. Uh, it's great. Myrtle Beach is, uh, it, it, we spent our 50th there. We're spending our anniversary here. It has deep romantic ties for us as a couple. And individually, it's very important to us. We're honored. I, I, so many festivals. You go to a festival and the, your movie's on a sheet. In, a, in yeah. a lodge, an Elks Lodge, and you're like, I can't really, you're kidding me, right? And the sound is through some, uh, you know, Bluetooth system. Yeah. We're gonna see it in a great theater. Yeah. Uh, you'll see a beautiful film colored by Goldcrest in New York. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm so excited. Uh, uh, Myrtle Beach is one of our favorite places. It's run very well, you can tell just right here that it's run very well, and, and um, we're honored. Flattered. Please. We, we are honored to have you here. And we're looking forward to seeing guest artists. So good. Good luck with it. We are too. Yeah. <laughs> we are too. We'll be watching we you. We love okay. watching uh, the At this point right here, film. we look at the movie and then we look to see, are they going for gum wrappers? Yeah. Are they talking? Are they bored? Are yeah. they restless? Who, yeah. left? Who left? Who left? Who left? Where are you going? Nobody's, Where allowed, are you to, going? nobody's allowed to leave yeah. your movie. No, please you have use to stay the restroom here. before the movie yes. starts. They lock the door and you, you have to stay there. There was a woman who was a wasted in Santa Barbara, falling asleep, uh, uh, wobbling. She got up to go, I, I felt stay. <laughs> don't come back. Please don't Please come don't back. Come yeah. back. Yeah. Please right. don't come back and, and or, yeah, go find some more Jack Daniels because it's filling the last three weeks. Well, it's delightful to have you here. Thank you so much for being thanks, here. Thanks, Joel. Thank Timothy you. Busfield, Melissa, thank you so much.